Hello, parents. I want to welcome you to the Connect School fifth grade parent presentation. I'm Jeff Hawkins, the principal, and I want to let you know that the staff and I are really excited to get to work with you and your great students this next year. You're about to embark upon, as are they, a three year journey of tremendous growth, not only academically, but socially and leadership skills and citizenship skills and in a variety of other ways. It's going to be a really wonderful time. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to just let you know that I am a presenter who enjoys presenting to a live audience as opposed to my computer screen. And I'm gonna be presenting a lot of information uh, that's important for you as a parent to know about how our program works and what you can expect, like in homework at night, uh, just a little bit of the structure of the school so you know how we operate. And so if you should ever feel like you need to hit the pause button and maybe go get a snack or take a little break and come back, that's no problem. Please do so as much as you need. You may or may not know, but the Connect Charter School was the very first charter school in the state of Colorado founded in 1993. It was the first in the state and among the first 10 in the nation. And we're getting ready to enter our 27th year of operation. I've been a part of District 70 for going on 24 years, and I've been at Connect for going on 15. So I really believe in this program. Otherwise, I wouldn't have stayed this long. And I look forward to continuing uh, a great career at this school. Let me start with sharing with you our, our vision and our mission uh, for each school year and working with wonderful students. Our vision says this, we envision a school in which all children receive the nurturance, guidance, and resources that they need to reach their fullest potential. And let me focus on the word nurturance for a moment. When I think about that word, I'm kind of reminded about when students, or, or rather children, start to walk for the first time. You know, they're, they're just entering that, that toddler uh, stage, and they're kind of pulling up on uh, furniture and starting to hesitantly try to take their first steps. And uh, as parents, we're holding on to them at first and kind of feeling a little nervous about them taking their first steps, not wanting them to fall, but knowing that that's a part of the process. And so as they do that, you know, we're holding on at first and then our hands let go, and but they're still right there uh, as a means of support. So as students trans transition from elementary to middle school, to me, it's, it's kind of like that where we as staff members are a little bit like that, where maybe we're holding on at first, providing support, and then we want them to take those extra steps. And then they do that and they gain confidence, but our hands are still right there as measures of support. So it's kind of like that in, in our environment where we want to provide the nurturance to let them know that we're right there to the extent that they need them. Some students don't need quite that much <clears throat> support to start with, and they're ready to take steps and start walking and even running. Uh, but we individualize that support structure to help students in just the way that they need it. And so that's why we like to have the word nurturance in our vision statement. Our mission is to create and sustain an equitable, intellectually vibrant, personalized school where students receive the necessary skills and knowledge for college in the workplace. Let me say that Connect is a college preparatory school. We have a rigorous, fast-paced curriculum, but with the right supports in place to help students be successful. Let me talk a little bit about our school schedule. So the doors open at 745 in the morning as parents need to be able to drop off their students before heading to work. And we, we have a zero hour built in for tutoring, um, at times for enrichment and, and for socialization for students that don't uh, need to attend tutoring from 7.45 to 8.30. Now, some of you may have already been contacted about uh, our thinking that we'd like to have your students plugged into tutoring right away to make sure, again, those support structures are in place. And tutoring in the morning begins at eight o'clock and goes right up until first hour at 8.30. Uh, 
at, at 830. Our first hour begins and we have 70 minute classes in the morning for our core areas, reading, writing, and math. So that's 830 to 940, 940 to 1050, and 1050 to 12 o'clock. Uh, at the beginning of the afternoon, our homeroom connections class starts. That's the name of our homeroom connections. And in that class, we have a variety of different activities, including eating lunch, uh, leadership classes. We have keyboarding classes to make sure students are uh, growing in that skill set. We have a variety of activities that we do. Uh, we have our physical education or physical fitness class embedded in our homeroom class, as well as foreign language. And we have three years of rotation of foreign language, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And so our connections class goes from 12 o'clock to 1.30. And that in that 90-minute period, they do a variety of different things 30 minutes at a time. At 1.30, our classes, our afternoon classes begin, and that's a two-hour and 15-minute block where we have social studies and science. And your student might have uh, science Monday, Wednesday, and then social studies Tuesday, Thursday, or vice versa. But uh, while that might seem like a long time, two hours and 15 minutes, there's a variety of hands-on activities that uh, our student, our teachers lead our students through. And uh, midway at some appropriate time, there's even a, a quick walk around the block to get some oxygen uh, in the lungs and, and blood pumping and a, sort of a transition so that students are ready to go for the next activity. Um, dismissal occurs at 345 and after school beginning at 345 to 420. We have our after school clubs and extracurricular activities that take place and I'll talk more about those in a little bit and uh, for some students will be in tutoring from 345 to 410. Uh, for those students who are not in tutoring or extracurricular activities, they have some additional social time. And uh, our study hall begins at 410 and goes to 430, and we'd like to have students picked up by 430. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that at times you need to come in to get your students, uh, particularly at 410 as, as they're, they're in study hall. But uh, oftentimes it's, it's even a little tough to get them out of the building because they, they enjoy being at Connect, and that's a good problem to have. So um, now I'm going to refer you to uh, some, some green sheets. You should have received a, a mailing from us. And uh, there's some information that I'm going to go over that are on uh, green colored sheets, and you'll get to see uh, at times um, some things that I'm referring to on, on your screen as well. So let me start with what you can expect from uh, each class. And so we're going to start with reading. And typically, we're going to have uh, a spelling list every week, about 20 words per week. With the very first few weeks in school, there, there may be only 10 words. But probably by the third week or so, you're going to see that go up to 20 words. And uh, each grade level has uh, half the words for that specific grade level, and then we have the other half that is for all grade levels. We'll be reading a junior great book story every week, uh, or nearly every week, and so what you can expect is the students will be hearing that story read to them from the teacher twice uh, on different days so that they really get the benefit of, of hearing the teacher uh, with, with great pronunciation and putting emotion into it so that it's pleasant to listen to, to really help them uh, better understand and comprehend what's going on in, in that piece of literature. We do fiction, we do nonfiction, and we do poetry as well in our, in our junior great book uh, pieces of literature. And so when they come home uh, that night after hearing it from the teacher, we want them to reread it because you need to, to engage with the literature a number of times to really get every piece of nuance and meaning out of it. And then we're going to have some, some vocabulary during the week, some comprehension questions that they're going to work through, and we're going to teach them how to do side notes. Um, that's 11 types of uh, elements of fiction, uh, and we're going to teach them how to identify it and how to analyze its significance to what's going on in that part of the story or the story as a whole. And the more they do side notes, 
the better prepared they get to participate in Socratic seminar, which is a really rich and deep discussion of the literature. And um, it, that really helps your students to grow in, in terms of how to analyze literature and engage with it at a, at a high and deep level. So it's very good. And then at the end of the week, uh, they need to study in preparation for the end of the week spelling test. So they can do that a little bit each night and they'll get those words about a week in advance. One of the great ways that you can help us um, in terms of support at home is Socratic Seminar will predominantly be on Thursdays. So by Wednesday night, they need to have finished their side notes. And one of our requirements is they need to do all their side notes um, completely and, and with, with quality in order to participate in that Socratic Seminar on Thursday. The teachers check through that right before seminar while they're doing their written response. So on Wednesday nights, if you could flip through each page and make sure that they have a side note on each page and something highlighted in the text that they're, they're pointing to in their side note, that would be very helpful. And so one of the things that they'll also have to do on a quarterly basis is read a book predominantly outside of class and they'll do a project uh, demonstrating their, their knowledge and understanding of that book at the end of each quarter. On the bottom of your reading handout, your green reading handout, it goes over our weighted grading system for that class. And you'll see that junior great book assignments are worth 40% of their grade. Regular assignments, including comprehension, vocabulary, and then later with some CMAS test prep assignments will be worth 25%. Spelling assignments are worth 20%, and the end of the quarter reading project will be worth 15%. So it's important that they do their best work on that, and we'll give them plenty of, of guidance and help, uh, particularly the first time they do that. And then we'll move on to math. Now we use Saxon math as our curriculum because we really like the way that it spirals its concepts. Some other math curriculum, uh, it, it, it's more conceptually based and it presents some instruction and information. Students practice it a little while, they're tested on it, and then they move on. Well, if they don't see that uh, with enough repetition, they're absolutely going to forget how to do it. And then particularly when it comes time for state testing, they, they won't remember. So with Saxon, it spirals and students get to see the concepts again and again with uh, enough repetition that they can get to a point of mastery, which is what we want in terms of skills. And so we start our sixth grade curriculum with the Saxon Course 2 book, which is a general seventh grade um, level book. But the way that we approach our instruction, we pitch it to them so they can hit it. And if they need any assistance, we have Tuesday morning tutoring, which will be begin after Labor Day. And that's from 8 to 8.30 every Tuesday morning. And uh, then our seventh grade students uh, use course three and our eighth graders use the Algebra One text. Uh, you can plan on students having uh, pretty much nightly homework in math because they need that level of repetition. They'll have 30 problems. We will give them problem set sheets with uh, grids, 15 uh, boxes on the first side and 15 on the other so that they can show their work. And it is particularly important, especially for sixth grade boys, that they need to understand, they need to show every step uh, so that the teacher can analyze are they, are they getting it right from step to step? Or is there a minor problem in some step that they're just forgetting to do? Because uh, we need to, the boys to understand, hey, we, we can't just open up your mind and, and see where you're not understanding. So when they show their work step by step, it helps us to identify how better to help them as they need it. And so again, 30 problems every night. They will uh, do daily note taking in two column notes. Uh, on the left-hand side, they have the, the concept, and on the right, the definition or, or example. And then the teacher leads them through step-by-step -step, uh, example problems that they write record right in their notes, and so uh, as well as practice problems. So one of the great benefits of the notebook is that if the student is struggling at home and the parent is saying, okay, well, I want to help you, but I'm not sure how, go to that notebook. It'll have a table of contents that they'll build every day 
so that you can go right to a concept that they might be struggling with and open it then to that page. And as a parent, you know, you might not remember how to do it, but if you go through our notes and our example problems, which are stepped out, I think you'll have a, a really great uh, chance to understand yourself how to help them. And, you know, if not, uh, ask them to come in and see the teacher the next morning. And if, as long as the teacher's not tutoring for another subject, they can get extra help before or after school, even above and beyond math tutoring on Tuesday mornings. We're always delighted to help when the students ask for it. Uh, you can expect that we'll have a test about once a week. Um, we test five lessons behind where we are in uh, the homework. So again, that gives them every opportunity to have the benefit of understanding concepts before they're tested on it. And so that we, we, we like using that system. At the bottom of the green sheet for math, you see that there's only two categories for our weighted grading system. And you'll note that we weight our tests by 70% and the homework is worth 30%. Part of that reason is uh, in the digital age, uh, students or parents have ample opportunity to go to Amazon or uh, eBay or other sites where you can just get the entire curriculum, uh, the test bank, uh, homework solution guides, and uh, they can be used the right way or they can be used the wrong way. Now, if you choose to purchase uh, the curriculum that way, and you ask your students to do all the work and then they want to check the work at the end with any of those solution guides, that's okay. But if they use it to avoid doing the thinking and skill building, then that's not helpful. Um, and, and some schools have changed their entire curriculum because uh, certain curriculum are available that way to just purchase. And so what we've done is we didn't want to change our entire curriculum, but we have rewritten all of our tests. So our tests and, and the corresponding test answer keys don't exist anywhere online. You can't buy them somewhere because we made them up. So our tests can't, the, the, you know, you, you can't go get the, the answers somewhere else. The homework you can, but if, again, if those answer keys or solution guides are used the right way, then great. We, we have no problem with that. But that's why we weight our tests so much and then the homework differently. Uh, moving on to writing, what you can expect in writing class is we, we often start out with daily oral language, which is a great way for students to analyze little pieces of writing with mistakes embedded in them. And they might have mistakes with spelling, with punctuation, with capitalization, with usage, with grammar. And so the more they get used to finding those little mistakes in those example sentences, the better they'll get finding those mistakes when we ask them to self-edit their own writing. And that's an important part that they do is with self-editing, as opposed to just having the teacher mark it all for them. Because when we get to later in high school and college, the teacher is not gonna mark everything for us. So that's a good process. And then we have three different types of writing assignments. We have goals and we have creatives and we have assigned pieces. And we use Nancy Atwell's uh, Writer's Workshop. And her program usually says it's great when students get to choose what they're gonna write about the vast majority of the time. And we agree with that uh, about 67%, uh, because there are times where students need to do, you know, descriptive uh, writing, narrative writing, persuasive writing, uh, expository, and, most of the time, students don't just wake up and say, wow, I, I feel like doing persuasive writing today. So a third of the time, we're going to assign the topic to them, and that's where we come up with the assigned pieces. But with goals or creatives, they get to have a voice with the, in conversation with the teacher to say, here's what I want to write about, or here's how I want to expand my writing horizons uh, into these different areas. And we have kind of like a laundry list of types of goal writing, uh, which can include uh, business letters, writing a letter to an elected official, um, resume writing and other things. And in creatives, uh, we do a lot of fun things like um, uh, family trees, or we might write a travel brochure 
and find out a destination uh, that would be great to go to and come up with all of the ways uh, to entice somebody to want to go there uh, in terms of attractions uh, at the site and um, what fun things there are to do there. So a lot of different opportunities uh, and, and our creatives have an artistic part as well. So students really enjoy doing that. And let me talk for a moment about our writing process because we use that with everything. We always start with a handwritten plan because students need to think about uh, what all they're going to do, what all they're going to cover and how they're going to go about it. And uh, having some sort of visual plan greatly helps students uh, to get organized with their thoughts. Then we have them handwrite their first draft. And that's really important because writing is, is, is kind of a, an, an organic um, uh, means of expression. And you have to be able to erase or draw a line through something or add some arrows. Um, and, and sometimes it's just hard to do on the computer. Sure, there's programs that do all of that. but um, for students to, to really get their thoughts out the first time in the first draft, we want them to do a handwritten draft. Then they're going to turn that in for um, uh, revision. And teachers will give them feedback on um, their ideas, their organization. If there's a prompt that they wrote to, did they cover all aspects of the prompt? Uh, and in, in some cases, maybe they didn't provide enough detail or an explanation or explain their reasoning well enough. So they give them written feedback and then students take that feedback, they make the appropriate changes and then they do the first typewritten draft. And at that point, they need to do self-edit. They need to see if they can find those spelling, capitalization, punctuation, usage or grammar mistakes as much as they can on their own, they need to mark those indicating to the teacher that yes, I did that step and they turn it into the teacher for teacher edit. And that is the first time it's graded is at the teacher edit stage. And the teacher edit will note what things that they marked with the self edit. They'll provide additional editing feedback, maybe even some additional organizational feedback like with revisions and they'll give it back to them and then they need to make those improvements and then finally they turn it into a final draft. But we don't do that lockstep with only one assignment. We don't go through all the steps beginning to end with one assignment. Because what we find is middle school students, shockingly, will get into a hurry and they'll rush through some of those and won't those steps and won't do a quality job. So we'll go through two or three steps of the process for an ass one assignment and then we'll set that aside and then we'll start another one and go down the road with that one for a while. And then at some point, we'll bring the other one back and they can look at it with fresh eyes, do a better job of improving it. And on the whole, they do more quality work that way. So that's why we do the start and stop. And in sixth grade orientation, uh, we'll show the students how to read their, their writing pacing calendar to know when those start and stops occur. And we'll have them color code the different types of assignments with goals, creatives, and assigned pieces to better help them keep track of that and stay organized. Um, we, you can expect about seven to nine pieces of writing per quarter. We do a lot of writing and that's how you get good at writing. And uh, there will be one grammar and punctuation test per quarter and those tests are cumulative. So from quarter to quarter, the tests will get longer because everything that was on the past test will be on the future test as well as new information, new skills covered. And so they're always given a study guide to prepare for that. The teacher goes over the study guide and they have the opportunity to correct any mistakes that they made on the study guide. So when it comes time to study, they have all the right answers to study from before taking the test. So using the study guide um, to, to get prepared is really important. And let me direct your attention to the bottom of the green writing page where it gives our weighted grading breakdown for writing class. You'll note that uh, assigned pieces are worth 30% of the grade, goals are worth 25%, creatives are worth 20%, the one grammar and punctuation per test is 15% of the grade, 
and mini lessons, uh, which are grammar focused, which help them again to get ready for that grammar and punctuation test or 10%. And I do want you to know that students will have writing homework most of the time. But now let me transition to talking about Connections homeroom class. Connections happens midday from 12 to 1.30 and includes lunch. So Connections is broken up into three 30-minute segments and lunch is always one of those. And one day out of the week, students will have the opportunity to bring a little money with them and go out to lunch with their homeroom class, either to Wendy's next door, across the street to Taco Bell, a little ways away to Subway, uh, just around the block to the uh, west of us, there's a nice deli. And then there's Carl's Jr. down on First Street. And so anytime if a parent doesn't want their child to eat fast food, they can just bring a sack lunch and the owners of the restaurant are just fine with students eating a, a lunch that they brought with them. Connections is made up of a lot of different activities. Uh, each week, students will have one makeup day if they need to do a little catch up on their homework. They participate in school cleaning, doing some light cleaning and helping clean the cafeterias some after lunch, just as a part of responsible citizenship. We want them to understand that they need to do a little part to help us keep their environment as clean as possible. And we like to think that maybe that might rub off a little bit on helping them keep their room cleaner at home. You never know. But uh, they also have a typing program that they work on to help them stay on top of and improve their keyboarding skills so they get more efficient with typing assignments. We have a variety of class competitions like chess competition, a manners competition where we teach them manners skills. And we have um, just a variety of other competitions where they compete against each other and the winning class gets a pizza party. And we even have a cotton candy machine in school and they can learn how to make cotton candy and they really enjoy that. Uh, and we have an activity day uh, every week. And at the beginning of the school year, we focus on get to know you activities. So the sixth graders can get to know their seventh and eighth grade peers and each other, uh, new sixth graders in their class as well. It, we want them to really develop some close knit relationships as they're going to be in that class for three years. And the connections teacher is the one who conducts parent student teacher conferences twice a year as well. Another class we have in connections is foreign language. And our foreign language class is meant to be an exposure level class, which focuses on vocabulary and conversational phrases and a little bit of culture. And this current year we were working on Italian. Next year will be Spanish, and the year after that will be French. So all students get three different language exposures and which is great because in high school they can pick the one that they like the best and focus in on that one as colleges on applications like to see when students really delve deeply into one particular language for two or three years and we also have activity days in connections and we have a leadership class where mr etienne or miss hill come in and teach leadership skills and the first activity that we have is called Cleaning Olympics. And they teach real cleaning skills in kind of an offhand, silly way. And so we have four activities in Cleaning Olympics and students are pretty competitive in these events. We start with vacuum cleaner races and then we proceed to the mop and sweep and then the dust and polish. And then we finish up with a big boofy competition. And, and boofies, how do I explain what boofies are? All the little things that fall to the ground uh, during the course of an active learning day, little pieces of paper or little trash, all of those things are coined boofies. And so our last competition is being able to set a series of boofies out and students pick them up as fast as they can and see who can do that uh, the quickest. And so we, during leadership, we also have a manners class. And years ago, Mr. Michaelis said, hey, if Harvard or Yale or Princeton can have a manners course, why wouldn't the Connect School have a manners course as well? Because what if at some point students need to have uh, a really important business meeting or possibly even um, an interview during a meal 
And if you kind of eat like a, a, a horse at a trough, then uh, that's not going to come across real well to somebody who has the potential to really help you out in your future. So we have a manners course as well, and we have a school-wide competition with that. Uh, not to mention we have uh, um, an annual rotation with our Halloween decorating competition. We One year we decorate doors, another year we decorate scenes, and another year we decorate pumpkins. Uh, we have uh, certain special competitions each year. This year we were slotted to have um, Marsville competition where students in working together in a class have to come up with a geometric figure that they build a really large scale version out of plastic and figure out how to inflate the thing. And all the class gets inside when it's inflated. And then that, that of course is a judged competition. And then another year we have CO2 car competition and races. And then we have a Delta dart competition where students design and build a plane and we see how long uh, a sustained flight can be where they compete against each other. And those are a rotation of competitions. Uh, but we also have a food drive that the proceeds directly go to benefit local needy families and a toy drive to benefit local needy children during Christmas time. And then to round out our activities and school competitions, we have a chess competition a typing competition, and even a bowling competition. And for bowling at the end of the year, it's cosmic bowling. So we get the bowling alley to turn on our black lights. And if the students want to decorate a white t-shirt with uh, some fluorescent markers or uh, their socks, then they can do that as well. And they really enjoy that. So lots of different activities uh, during Connections, uh, really a, a variety of just kind of relaxing and having fun and getting some important citizenship skills as well. And Connections does not receive a letter grade. Uh, it, it's just sort of a different pace and a, a different focus, but very much skill-based during the midday. And then in the afternoon, we have our social studies and science classes, our application classes, and they meet twice a week. Now, social studies might be Tuesday, Thursday, whereas science was Monday, Wednesday, or vice versa. And they're two hours and 15 minutes. And so these classes are extended to be able to allow continuity in the topic being studied. And uh, we have field trips uh, scheduled at times, guest speakers that come in, and the opportunity to do real research. Uh, most work is completed in class, so not a lot of homework other than to prepare for tests. And students will have a study guide in social studies and in science, the things that they do uh, in their lab notebook. That tool is then uh, directly available for them to study and to get prepared for their tests. Uh, dates for tests are listed in the nine weeks planner. And the weighted grading system for social studies is broken down into thirds. So assignments and journals and tests are each a third of the grade. And in science, the same way, assignments, labs, and tests are each a third of the grade. Now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about exhibitions. This class is one of the most transformative things that we do for your students while they're at Connect. Each year, National History Day releases a theme uh, to guide the research of all student participants. This year, it was breaking barriers in history. In past years, there have been themes like triumph and tragedy, conflict and compromise. The coming year is going to be communication in history, the key to understanding. And that's going to be a really exciting topic. But what we do is mid to late September, we pull one of the two days for social studies per week and one of the two days for science per week. And we schedule a new class into the student's schedule and they have a, a different teacher for exhibitions. And so they'll begin to go to that class twice per week uh, during the afternoon. And we'll start helping them to identify what topic they might be interested in based on their class, their classroom teacher's sub theme 
and then we'll take them to Rawlings Library where they do real research and they learn the difference between primary and secondary sources and how to identify a good uh, website for a source versus not a great website. Uh, you know, the difference between Library of Congress and the National Archives versus Wikipedia and BrainyQuotes.com. Uh, there's a pretty stark difference there. But then they take that research and we help them organize it into a real research paper. And they do parenthetical citation uh, and a, an annotated bibliography. We teach them how to develop a display board um, in clusters focusing on historical background, the trigger of an event, the actual event, and then what were the short-term and long-term impacts in history of that event. And then they do a little speech of about 90 seconds with an accompanying PowerPoint. And in mid-October, we invite you and other members of the community down to the Sangre de Cristo Arts Center to view the project that they've worked on for about 17 weeks. And you can't believe the, the, the joy and the satisfaction on your child's face when they've done all of that work and grown and been stretched to see what they can really produce. But the other thing I, I got to tell you is along the way, because it is a team project and they're, they're evaluated and graded individually, so somebody else can't mess up your kid's grade, um, the, the, the work that they do will help them get the grade that they earn. But I, I, I always ask this question during uh, the fifth grade pre uh, parent presentation. How many of you in your jobs work with other people? I think probably most of you. And does that always go swimmingly? Do you guys ever have any conflict with any of your coworkers? Do you ever have to problem solve? Do you ever have to work something out in a, a, a nice and professional manner, even though you might feel a little grumpy on the inside? Yeah, I, I think we all do. And that is a very much a skill to be learned. And this is where the, your student, if they haven't already run into that before in their educational process, they're going to run into it in exhibitions, likely. Uh, but I, I want to be honest with you. There's some different ways that we can handle that. If they start coming to you and say, you know, uh, this guy named Jeff is, is in my exhibitions group and, and he's just driving me nuts. He's not doing his work. Um, you know, he just is frustrating. Sometimes he just behaves in an annoying manner and I'm having a hard time getting my work done, what do I do? And as a parent, you might say, well, why don't you try talking to Jeff and say, hey, can we please focus on this? Or, or when you do this, it, it, I find it distracting. And I, I would just like to ask you not to do that. And your student can, that's like level one of, of trying to problem solve. But if, you know, if that doesn't work, then, uh, they might talk to the group leader and say, I'm struggling here. Can you help me out? If that doesn't work, they should have a conversation with the teacher. If that doesn't work, they should have a conversation with Mrs. Bull, the dean of students, or maybe Mr. Etienne, teacher on special assignment that helps me with discipline, or me, and let us get involved. There's a lot of times, and we've done this many times over the years, where we can just kind of have the, the, the students sit down together with us as a group and say, hey guys, you are all wonderful students. And we just like having you here a ton. But I understand that there's a little bit of a, an interpersonal difficulty within the group and nobody's in trouble, but we just wanna sit down and, and kind of help you through it. And that can be effective and successful many, many, many times. Uh, you know, high 90s percentage. And so we need that opportunity. So if, if your student comes to you and says, you know, Jeff is just driving me nuts and I've tried this and this and this, then you might have to say, well, have you talked to Mrs. Bull or Mr. Etienne or Mr. Hawkins? Because we need to give that a try. Please do that before, you know, getting to a point where the student is so frustrated and then you're really frustrated. And then you, you give me a call and say, wow, this is not working out. We need to like change classes. What if if it's a research class and we're, 
you know, X number of weeks into it, we can't start over. Too much has already gone under the bridge. Too much water has already passed. So you need to communicate with us as school officials if help is needed and we can help, let me assure you. But this is something that is a life skill. We want them to be able to work through because when they sit down with us and we work through it, they see that it's possible with the right supports and they need your support, they need our support, but then they gain confidence so that the next time there's an issue, whether it's in exhibitions or in some other class, some other year, maybe in high school, they have some experience working through a difficulty as opposed to going around it or getting out of it. And that's one of the most important things that we believe we can teach your student is how to problem solve like a young adult even though they're still kids, because we support them doing that. So I just want to tell you, if this happens, I've given you the script to follow on how to get us involved so that we can help. And we're, we're good at this. I don't want to kind of pat myself on the back, but we've done this before, and we know what to do to help your student in that regard. Exhibitions is going to grow and stretch them. And sometimes, you know, the growing and stretching process isn't always comfortable, but on the other side of it, man, there's lots and lots of benefits. And I guarantee you, your child is going to benefit greatly each year they go through this. And then when they get to that junior level uh, research paper in high school, it's a piece of cake. I've had countless kids come back and tell me, wow, what I learned at Connect uh, in exhibitions over three years it, the, the, the research paper as a junior was so easy. I had all kinds of other kids coming to me, some in tears, not knowing what to do. And I just knew what to do because you guys have taken me through the process, not once, but three times. And I'm all the better for it. And I didn't have parents, you know, making them come in and tell us that they came in on their own maturity because they saw the benefit of it. And they, they shared that with us themselves. So that's always exciting to hear really exciting. So at this time, I, I think we're done with our green set of papers. And now we're going to move on to the pink colored papers. And the first one is about school information, policies, and school expectations. And sixth grade orientation is going to be really great. Uh, it's scheduled for Thursday, August 13th, and Friday, August 14th. The students come to us for about a half a day from 8.30 to 12.30. And it's kind of nice for them because they don't have homework those two nights, but they get to learn a whole bunch of the processes of how school works at Connect. So they can start to feel comfortable with that before the older students get there. And I love uh, orientation. It's so much fun to see the, the students and their energy and excitement. And plus we get to do our handprints so that they know that they're making a mark on connect that's going to last forever and they're really making a, a mark on our hearts as well that's going to last forever and then the second day they sign their handprint so some of the school requirements we expect good attendance as i said before we are a college prep rigorous and fast-paced school so if if students miss a lot they have a lot of makeup work and then the more makeup work builds the harder it is to get caught up so that's pretty tough we expect students to follow the school rules and the dress code, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. We need a sustained effort in academics and students to do all assignments to a high level of quality. We don't do zeros. Um, other schools do that, but when they say, oh, okay, you don't have to do that, maybe, maybe some teachers say, okay, cool, then I, I have less grading. But if then they don't make the student do the assignment, then there's skill gaps and we don't do skill gaps at connect so every student needs to do every assignment and we're going to follow up if they don't and as a matter of fact our policy is if they've not turned in an assignment a teacher is going to ask the student to go and make a phone call on one of our school cell phones right outside the classroom so they can watch the class and monitor your student and the student's gonna call and say mom dad i need to let you know i didn't complete this assignment now, the first time it happens, there might be some tears involved, 
well, we're not torturing your kid. We're just saying, hey, this is what we do. And if you didn't do it, we just need to make sure parents know so that they can help you that night, make sure that it gets done and turned in the next day. And then we'll have a little bit of a late penalty, but it's usually about 15%. You know, in if, if we have a lot of lates, then that percentage will go up. But we don't want to have a too big of a penalty because we still want them to have incentive to get the work turned in. And so uh, that's how we do that. Uh, student assessment with our report cards. We have not only a report card with uh, just A's, B's, and C's on it. We have something called report to parents that breaks down your student's grade percentage within those weighted categories that we've already talked about. So if there's a specific area that your child is having trouble with in, in say, writing or reading, we can narrow in and identify which area they need uh, some additional help, possibly through tutoring if they're not already attending tutoring. But then that's where that communication comes in that we inform you of what areas they're doing well in, but other areas where they could uh, experience some growth or make some improvements. Uh, we also have, oh, in, in exhibitions, you your student gets a grade, and we have a, a specific rubric that we follow for that, and you'll get that grade uh, about the end of the third quarter. We have an end of the year portfolio, which shows growth over time, and a, a number of their assignments were, that they just did an excellent job in. And then, of course, we, we do appreciate student participation in uh, the Colorado major, Majors of Academic Success, CMATS. It's an external test, and uh, we like other sources of validation that says our students are doing a, a great job, they're working hard, but it also helps us to know if, if we're doing uh, a good job with our instruction or if we need to fine tune anything or do anything differently. That's an exter external measure that helps us. We do have two student parent teacher conferences each year. And noted, notice I included your student in there. We require the students to attend because they're a very important part of that um, uh, combination to have them be successful. I mean, they it, it can be effective if this the parent and the, the teacher talk, but the student needs to be included so that they directly hear what they're doing well and maybe what other areas where we maybe need them to give some additional effort. We do have sports in that our students can participate in the school or district of their home attendance area, whether that's district 60 or 70 uh, in all team sports. And at Connect, we, we have a Pueblo Rangers soccer team that's been very successful. I think they've, if they haven't won the championship, they've been like first runner up. And we have that in the fall and the spring. Uh, we've got a great team of kids, a great coach. And then we have the opportunity for uh, young ladies to play volleyball in the South Progressive League in the spring. So those are two options. But Connect doesn't have its own formalized athletic program. Anytime students are leaving early, we would ask that they would check in with the afternoon teacher where they, they had to miss a little bit of class the very next morning to see what they missed so that they can get that work made up as soon as possible. Uh, in, in regards to prearranged ab absences, we know that that's going to take place. There, there's going to be times where uh, parents have vacations coming that don't coincide with Thanksgiving or Christmas or spring break. So uh, we know that that happens. And if you need to be gone, what we would like to have you do is tell us with as much notice as possible so that we can have your student do the work in advance of the absence. Um, and, you know, that that's where things are known. If you if somebody has an emergency or a family tragedy, God forbid, then uh, certainly that can be done after the fact. And we'll work with you and your student on that. But anything that's known that's planned, we'd like to have that done in advance of the absence. And if it's not or you tell us and then the student just doesn't do it in advance and turns it in after the fact, then it's going to be subject to a 10 percent. Uh, deduction on those assignments. But we would ask that uh, prearranged absence be infrequent and short duration, if at all possible, uh, because 
any time that they're out of the classroom, they do miss the instruction from the teacher, and it's just not the same. The learning is just not the same. So, and I talked about uh, when students don't have their work done that we're going to call you. Uh, we can leave a message on your cell phone, but that's how we communicate with you. It's a personalized way to communicate that. Uh, we, we don't really use email a lot, uh, much at all. And uh, if there's some extenuating circumstances where uh, an email needs to be used, then that usually comes from me. Um, parents can contact the teacher of their students anytime regarding schoolwork and anytime they have questions. We do have a closed campus. And so students before school or after school, they, they need to be under our supervision until you or your designated uh, pickup adult picks them up. So we, we can't let them go over to Wendy's and wait for you to pick them up. Or we, we can't have them go over there and, and you say, well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be there in 10 minutes or I'm going to send my, my parent to pick them up in a short time. They're only gonna be waiting there a little, a little while. The thing is, I have no control over who's uh, in Wendy's. They might be a really great person or they might be someone with really ill intent and kind of an evil person. And if I can't guarantee that, I, I'm responsible for them until you or your designee picks them up and I'm gonna take good care of them. I can't let them stay in an unsupervised environment where bad people might be around. So we, we, we just can't let them go to a restaurant or some unsupervised location after school. Now, in your packet, you should have a blue copy of our fourth nine week planner from this school year. And this is a great tool for you to talk to your students about what's coming up and how to plan ahead. Um, one way they can do that is if, if they feel any pressure to meet writing deadlines. Goals are creatives since they do something called goal conferencing at the beginning of each quarter with their teachers and they plan out what they're going to do. They can start a goal or creative with their handwritten plan and, and handwritten draft before it even shows up in the class. They could do it, they could start it the week, the weekend before. So that is a, a good way to get ahead if they're kind of struggling with sometimes meeting deadlines. But all the tests that occur in the quarter are on here. If we have some other schedule where we don't have school on a Monday, that's on there. You get to see whenever we're doing uh, planning on Fridays, or if we have staff development, or uh, when we're having our Socratic seminar generally on Thursdays. This document just has a wealth of information. And what you may want to do is when you get it in the mail, because you'll get a copy and your students will get a copy, maybe you even want to put it on your refrigerator. Because uh, we've got, uh, the, in the packet that we sent home, we've got a nice refrigerator magnet. If your refrigerator is one of those that, that works with magnets, I know some of the stainless steel ones don't, but just in case. And then you have a copy of our school calendar. This is, again, a great wealth of information, uh, letting you know when we're in session, when we're not. It helps you to know when our open house is, like September, I want to say, 9th, Wednesday, September 9th. It helps you to know when school picture days are or when group picture days are. Uh, it helps you to know whenever we're doing staff development or like February 15th, just happens to be President's Day, there's no school that day. Uh, it helps you to know when breaks are, uh, and even when we think we're going to do CMAS testing starting next April 5th. So really great to have, and you'll, you'll have a copy of this. And, oh, then we gotta talk a little bit about our school rules. Okay, before we transition to talk about Connect School Rules and the dress code, if you haven't taken a pause break yet, you might want to do so. Uh, feel free. Okay, so Connect School Rules. Uh, here are the highlights. You have a copy of, of all of our rules. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the highlights. Number one, we expect students to be polite and respectful to each other and to staff members. And we, we're going to have that same expectation of ourselves to them. We're gonna treat them with respect. 
and to the and they we we want them to treat uh, any members of the public that they might come into contact with if they're on a, a, a trip out of the school or going out to eat or taking um, a, a walking field trip to skating and bowling anywhere they're going outside of the school and they come into contact with the public we want them to be respectful obvious rules include certainly no alcohol no tobacco no weapons no fighting all of those are suspendable offenses and it would likely get them uninvited from connect as they would from any other school we do have a no touch policy and the reason for that just at a middle school level i'm sure the vast majority of our student population could have a, a handshake or a little friendship hug or something where they would do it respectfully the problem is with middle school students is they just want to do it over and over and over again and so what we want to teach them about that is you know when i see uh, a member of the staff i don't necessarily need to shake their hand or give them a high five in between every class period so <clears throat> we're teaching them the appropriate time and place to do it but for the most part because of middle school the age group is we just have to say no can't do it because i can't be uh, the policeman that says yep that's okay that's okay that's not okay or i wouldn't get much else done uh, we do have walking rules to ensure safe movement anytime we're going out to lunch or to skating and bowling or on a walking field trip anywhere we're going we walk two by two we have the whole class stay together and we have them on alert to listen to the teacher for instructions to make sure that nobody crosses any street uh, without the teacher's go ahead and that for major streets we only cross in areas where they have crosswalks so we move around safely um, with the exceptions of connections we don't have food or drink in the classroom they do have the capability of having a water bottle in class because it's important to stay hydrated we would ask that they not be made out of glass because you know those can be dropped and then we'd have a safety issue so uh, but they can have a water bottle in any class uh, staff reserves the right to confiscate any items deemed inappropriate to the learning environment or anything that might be a distraction and we prefer that they not bring those items to school um, the school phone is available when parents need to call and talk to their student for any reason or if there's a concern and the student needs to call a parent we're going to ask them hey what what do you need to call for because we don't want to just say hey i forgot to tell them something that might not need to take place right then to get out of class to do so so we're, we're going to monitor that a little bit and say okay that that's a good reason to call mom or dad or you know that could probably wait till during connections or maybe just catch up with your parents uh, after school that doesn't sound like an emergency that needs to be communicated right now now for cell phones we would ask that they have them off not just vibrate but powered down from the point that they step foot on school property to the point where they're picked up off of school property it, it's not good for you to call their cell phone or text them at the end of the day hey i'm up in the parking lot come come over here um, talk to them and have a plan before the school day begins so that they know where to meet you or if you didn't have that opportunity and maybe plans changed call the front office and then ask either for us to give them a message or we can go and get them out of class and you can talk to them using the school phone. We would really appreciate that. But they cannot use their phones, their cell phones during the school day, not to text, not to check social media, not even to check the time. I mean, they can wear a watch. We've got lots of uh, clocks all over the school for them to tell time. So this, the, phone, the cell phones need to be powered off anytime they're at school or on a school trip. Um, we would ask greatly that you would help us out with monitoring your student's cell phone and social media use at home. There are times where they, they can make poor decisions or decisions that are not in their best interest outside of school, but then something negative happens and then it affects other students while they're at school. And then I'm, I'm involved. 
or Mr. Etienne's involved who helps me with student discipline. And sometimes we have to call parents and say, did you know that? Or your student is doing something or communicating in an inappropriate fashion outside of school, but it's affecting things in school. So if, if you monitor what they're doing on social media or put in place limits, or, or maybe, you know, when everybody goes to bed, they're no longer using social media and, and doing things that you don't know about. I, I think that's wise. And I just want to ask for your help in that area because those investigations can take a whale of a long time. And sometimes they can have far reaching consequences that sometimes we even have to notify the Pueblo police about. And things then are even out of my hands in terms of where it goes from there. Well, then it might be forwarded to the district attorney for potential action. And that always gets alarming for all of us. The school internet is only to be used for academic purposes and students must have staff permission to use it. They can't just go hop on a computer and surf around at the inter on the internet at school. So let me talk about the dress code. Our philosophy is, number one, where we don't have uniforms for a reason. When kids have uniforms, the decision-making of what to wear that's appropriate is totally taken out of their hands because it's assumed that they can't make appropriate decisions. We don't believe in that. We want to have a dress code that they can make good decisions within parameters, but they still have some decision-making ability. That helps them to learn what's appropriate and what's not. And when they wear something that's not, we're gonna call you and let you know and say this needs to not be worn back to school. Or if for some reason something was possibly inappropriate enough, we might say, hey, somehow can you bring down something different for them to wear. Uh, and then if that's not possible, I have a variety of sweatpants and sweatshirts that they could wear um, over whatever they have. And that is uh, appropriately non-aesthetic to probably make them not want to do that again. So we have that option as well. Uh, shirts with no sleeves must have at least three inches of material up here. Uh, in order to be appropriate. So anything that was a spaghetti strap would not would not work within our dress code. Uh, any short skirts or dresses must meet the tip of the middle finger when arms are at, at rest at the sides. Um, thankfully that this trend is no longer in fashion, but we don't want any sagging pants. That just doesn't look good. Um, we do have designated hat days, but Outside of the designated hat days, we don't want to wear hats. Um, clothing must not have on them or make any references to anything pertaining to violence, aggressive behaviors, tobacco, drugs, alcohol, vulgarities, obscenities, any sexual behaviors or innuendos, death, skulls, etc. cetera. Um, we, th those types of things can just be a distraction in school. Uh, and just carry, you know, negative uh, connotations. And that's that's not the philosophy of, of the Connect School. One of the things that has been a big deal in the past, and we made a change this last year, is that we said, young ladies, we please do not want you to wear leggings or stretch pants. Um, the jeggings, jeans are okay, because they're a little bit thicker material, but but the true leggings, we, we, we just don't want those. In the past, we tried to say, okay, if you had a shirt or a sweater that was long enough to cover the posterior, but that was a, a battle that we felt was a losing one, and it took up a lot of administrative time to try to enforce, and, and so we just don't want to do that. We want to spend our time differently than monitoring that. Pajamas should never be worn to school, okay? If any of us want to see that, all we got to do is go to Walmart. We can see tons of people with pajamas, but we don't want to see them at school. Um, and, and, you know, slippers, pajama slippers are not okay. Sweats are okay as long as they look clean and they're not ripped and torn and all of that kind of thing. And by the way, jeans should not have holes or tears in them or an area that's threadbare that's, you know, would be a hole if the threads could just be spread apart a little bit. That just doesn't look business professional and we're trying to help them to understand if we're, if we're coming to work and when you come to school, you just don't have your job yet. So it's like coming to work. Let's, let's look 
like we're getting ready to do good work, uh, like we're going to um, get engaged in some business. Jeans with holes in them and threadbare stuff is like what we wear on the weekends. They're nice and comfortable, but we don't wear them to work. Okay. Footwear must be worn at all times. Appropriate clothing for physical fitness on those scheduled days. They can wear clothing that is a, allows for a little bit more mobility and, and flexibility, but it should never allow um, a midriff to be bare um, or be too loose. Uh, so that when they bend and do their activities, um, the, the shirts uh, kind of come away from the body too much. Okay, let me talk a little bit about hairstyles. We would like to have students uh, choose hairstyles that would be considered traditional in nature, anything befitting a professional environment. So boys, we would ask that nobody shave their head uh, if they want to have um, a clipper, we'd like to have it be at like at least a, you know, a three if it's everywhere. Um, we would like the boys not to have their hair longer than a t-shirt collar. This not my collared shirt, but a t-shirt collar. Um, and then in general, for hairstyles, we'd like the bangs not to kind of cover up one of the eyes or both eyes so that we're trying to find where how to look them in the eye when we're having a conversation with them. Anytime anybody wants to dye their hair, if they dye all the hair, we'd like it to be plus or minus one shade from their natural hair color. If they want to get highlights, then we allow for plus or minus two shades from their natural hair color. So I, I have kind of a light brown hair. If I were to dye my hair platinum blonde, that would not work. If I were to dye my hair all black, that would not work. And you know, why, why do we do that? Anytime the students make big, big changes, everybody kind of does that and says, oh my gosh, look at that. And it tends to be a distraction and that's taking away possibly from other students' academic progress. And at Connect, we have a pretty good focus on academic success. So we don't want things that are going to be distracting. Um, we have this last bullet here that says no additions like feathers or colored braids or beads, tinsel or other additions. And we had to add that a few years back because a lot of young ladies wanted to do those things right after the state fair. Uh, but then it was almost like, you know, they dyed their hair color dramatically different. So we would ask that those not be added to hair. Now for jewelry, it just needs to be appropriate, traditional and not excessive. We don't want nose piercings or eyebrow piercings or tongue or lip or navel, that should be covered the whole time. But uh, those other pierce, piercing areas, we, we would ask that that not take place. For gauges in the earlobes, we don't want large holes or gauges through the earlobes and a long time ago we had to add you know the spikes that go all the way through and stick through we, we don't want any of those and then again we would just ask that you would review all school rules the full dress code and the walking rules in detail as they will all be followed and enforced and i i gave you a summary but i didn't hit every one but the students are responsible and parents are responsible for knowing all of our our rules and the last thing is on, on this particular um, part of your handout and then diagram on the screen, we believe Connect has a system that's based on success. To the students, we say, ladies and gentlemen, you will do the work. We will teach you and your parents will support you and your efforts and you'll learn. So it, it's kind of like we're a tripod. Um, the students are a leg, the parents are a leg. Connect staff is a leg, and without all three legs doing their part, the tripod won't stand. So we're all integral in this process. We all depend on each other. We can't do it without the other two. So uh, that's just a little thought there. And you see our, our emblem of uh, a blue ribbon school of excellence. And we had the opportunity to uh, receive that award a couple years ago where we went to Washington DC to receive it. And that was one of the highlights, I think, of my career. Not that I did it, because I certainly didn't. 
it was the students and the staff and the parents all working together as a group of three over years and years and years. And, and Mr. and Mrs. Michaelis that built the system, us working together, it, it was an honor for us all. Uh, an honor I'm, I'm so pleased to share with generations of students and parents and staff. And so I thank you for that. And I just wanna say thank you for viewing our presentation. And I know that at times I probably was a little monotone. I didn't mean to be, but if I had a live audience, I would have I would have done better. So thank you for listening to it. Don't tell me how many times you hit pause. That's fine. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening.